is going to work. So that's Easter Sunday, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And a, a couple of other dates for your diary. Sa Saturday the 17th of April will be, um, Lord willing, my ordination. And uh, again, we'll send more information about that uh, nearer the time. But that's in April. Do, do be in prayer for that, that it will be an encouraging time for us all. And then our Saturday, 24th of July, our church day out, um, COVID depending, of course, but save the date, 24th of July, at Gretton Village Hall. I think that's our notices for today. Let's hear our call to worship as we come to worship our God at the close of this Lord's Day. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Let us pray as we worship our God together this evening. Our Heavenly Father, please fill our hearts with joy. Fill our mouths and our lips and our tongues with praise. Enlarge our hearts that we may see wonderful things from your word. That we may see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of that certain future hope that we have in Christ. That heavenly glory. Our Father, we pray, bless us. Be with us now as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to sing our first hymn together, which you'll find on the screen. Thanks, Dave. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. Great I am, the three in one. <laughs> pray together. Oh, glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. 
Glory be to God the Spirit, great Jehovah, three in one. Our glorious and great God, our wonderful Trinity, almighty God, the living God, the creator God, the sustainer, the unchangeable, the infinite, the all-knowing, the all-present, the almighty God. We thank you and praise you that we creatures that you have made <clears throat> can give you glory, can ascribe to you the glory due your name, can praise you, can shout for joy. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are a great God, three in one and one in three. Father, we thank you that you are the source, the originator, the initiator of all creation, salvation. We thank you for speaking, sending your word by which you created all things, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you sent to save, to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you, our Lord Jesus Christ, for pouring out your spirit. We give us new birth and new life. They bring us into union with you. They bring us wonderful faith and trust. And who is shaping us and growing us in grace, producing those fruit of the spirit in our lives, Christ-likeness, that it may shine through us as we're recreated, restored. Oh, we thank you and praise you, our great God. Thank you for the glory of your creation and the glory of your recreation in the Lord Jesus Christ, by your spirit, all to your glory. Let us praise you and give thanks to you and taste and see tonight that you are good. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible reading uh, this evening comes from Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 to Philippians 4 verse 1. We're continuing in our studies in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, to the Philippians. After this Sunday evening, after tonight, we're going to take a two-week break for Easter and then we'll continue with our, our studies in Philippians um, on the 11th of April, I think. So let us hear the word of God from Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Amen. This is the word of God. 
before we come to look at God's word together from that passage in Philippians 3, let us let us pray together. Our great and almighty God, we thank you and praise you for the lordship of Jesus Christ over the entire world and not just the world, but the entire cosmos. We thank you that in every country, everywhere the light touches, he is Lord and he is King over every aspect of life. And Father, we think of our lives at the moment and and they are, yes, difficult because of COVID, but as Christians, they are without persecution. And yet we need to remember our brothers and sisters who are yours and who you belong to them, who are being heavily persecuted around the world even today. Those who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, those who pray our Father with us, those who we are united to together in Christ, those who we will spend an eternity with in that glorious future in the new heavens and the new earth. And yet today they are facing dreadful persecution. Father, we thank you for organisations like Open Doors and the Barnabas Fund. We thank you for their faithful reporting and their seeking to help and to minister to those suffering. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Nigeria, especially for those 39 who were kidnapped just this week. Lord, we pray that you'll bless the government there. Give them all wisdom and insight that they might know exactly how to handle this situation. We pray for those who have, who have, are holding them, that, that they might release them, that you might be at work in their lives, that it might be for their salvation that you have brought these Christians to them. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for the softening of the hearts of those in government in Egypt, that they are now beginning to allow Christianity and Judaism, the Bible, to be taught in schools, in religious education in Egypt, that heavily Islamic country. Father, we thank you for this open opportunity. We pray that through it, seeds will be sown and it will do a great and glorious work in Egypt. Please be at work there, Father. Lord, we pray for the situation in Ethiopia, for the war that's going on there at the moment with Eritrea, for the violence and, and massacre against Christians and ministers and churches there, as in many other places. Please bring them peace. Please protect your people. Please help them to trust you. Bless those who have lost loved ones, those who don't know whether their family, husbands, wives, children are alive or not. We pray that they will trust you, depend on you and look to this glorious future, this wonderful hope we have in Jesus Christ, which will be free from all pain, all death, all separation. Oh, Father, bless them. Help us to remember our brothers and sisters in prayer. Lord, we pray and help us now as we come to your word that we may gain a greater vision of that great future we have in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> what do you think about when you think about the future, when you hear the term the future, what do you think about? What do you think about the next year? What are you thinking about the next 10 years, 20 years? What are you thinking about when it comes to the future? Well, people in our society have very mixed feelings about the future. You might have noticed. A lot of people talking about making plans, looking forward to summer holidays, looking forward to growing up and getting married and having children, looking forward to retirement, building hopes and dreams, looking forward to finishing school, looking forward to when, when COVID is over and things can get back to normal. There's, there's a height of excitement when it comes to the future. 
But then on the other hand, there's also a dread and a worry because of the uncertainty. Yes, we get excited about some things, but we don't want to think too far ahead into the future. I don't want to think about what, it's, what it'll be like when I get older, when I have to stop working, when I have to leave home, when my children leave home. I don't want to start, I don't want to think about the next 10 years. It's, it's too much. I don't want to be worrying about tomorrow. I don't want to be thinking about death itself. So there's mixed feelings, isn't there? On one hand, there's an excitement. On the other hand, there's a, a worry and an anxiety about the future, about because of the uncertainties about it. I want to, at one hand, keep it at arm's length. On the other hand, they're trying to plan away the uncertainties, savings, building up a pension so that I know exactly what I'm going to be doing in 10 years time. Trying to deal with the uncertainty, trying to deal with the unknown. It leaves people confused and worried. Well, what about the Christian? <clears throat> what should we think about when we think about the future? How should it make us feel? Worried? Excited? What should we think? Well, for Paul, who's been writing to the Philippians, wanting them to be united together, wanting them to be standing firm, striving together, which is what he's been talking about since chapter 1, verse 27, which says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel, the good news of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. He's been writing about the attacks that they have from inside that will causes the un unity to break up pride. And so he's been teaching them and exhorting them about humility, Christ-like humility, which he says you can see in, in, in servants among you like Timothy, like Epaphroditus. He's been teaching them and protecting them, wanting to instruct them and warn them against attacks from the outside, false teachers. Who bring, who bring a different Christianity. And Paul, again, in chapter 3, 1 to 11, has been giving his example of what true Christianity looks like. But in this last section, in this next section, about the end of chapter 3 and the very first verse of chapter 4, Paul is, again, still sticking with his example and the example of Timothy and Paphroditus, you see in verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. But this time, his focus is on what should the, what, what is the focus of true Christianity? What should be our focus of our unity together? What are we striving for? We're standing firm together, but what direction are we striving for? Well, he wants them to be future focused. He wants them to be future focused. In verse 11, he says but that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead talking about when Christ comes again, glorification, that's a future event. Then he says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on. I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. In verse 14, I press on, I pursue, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says in verse 20, that our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await, we eagerly await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see his language here? It's future focused, it's pressing on, it's pursuing, it's waiting eagerly for what? For Christ to be with him 
to be glorified together with Christ. It's a future focus. And that's what he ends up saying together in chapter four, verse one. My brothers whom I love and long for, stand firm thus in the Lord against all outside attack. Attack from inside, humbly stand firm thus in the Lord, being future focused. Oh, eagerly awaiting the Lord Jesus Christ, pressing on, standing firm together, waiting for Christ. It's this future focus, which is not a future that is uncertain, not a future that is in jeopardy. It's not a future that is not guaranteed, but he is confident. This is the future you can have confidence in. No uncertainty, no doubt. Christ is all in all. And so the future is safe and secure in Christ. So what do you think about when you think about the future? It should be one of confident joy. One of excitement, one of certainty of being with Christ, being in heaven being in the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to see in our passage this briefly this evening, Paul is future focused and he's giving them an example. Remember, he's future focused in his mindset, in his way of thinking, and he's future focused in his lifestyle, which flows from what he, how he thinks. So firstly, then Paul is future focused in his mindset. Do we see this from verse 12 to 16 of chapter 3? In verse 15, it says, Let those of us who are mature think this way. He's talking about how should we as Christians think? What should our mindset be like? Well, firstly, he's acknowledging his imperfections. You see that in verse 12 and 13 says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. Because there were false teachers going around who were saying that you can attain perfection. You can become sin free today. They were denying a lifelong battle. They were saying today, by your choice, you can choose to not sin anymore and you can attain that perfection. And Paul is saying, no, that's not possible. Remember in Romans 7, Paul is talking about that battle that Christians have. I want to do good, but I keep doing bad. There's that battle between what I want and what I do. It's the battle that we all face, isn't it? Yes, we, we would love to be sin free. And yet we find ourselves drawn to sinful thoughts or actions or words. We're tempted from all around. And this battle will continue while we live in a fallen world. We are at the same time, yes, saved, united to Christ. Being made new. But we will also, also struggle with sin until Christ comes again. That's what Paul is saying. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on. I press on to make it my own. He's talking about his glorification. He's talking about when Christ comes again and he is given a new resurrected body made completely new. Made perfect, made like Christ. That when he comes, we will see him. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. He's saying this is something he's not yet obtained yet. This is something that he, he's struggling with. It's a battle that we all face. But he's pressing on. He's pressing on. He's striving. He acknowledges his imperfection. He acknowledges his sinfulness and the battle and the struggle. And that causes him, because of what he's not, because of what he's struggling with, to strive to attain the prize, you see in verse 12. To press on, which means to pursue or to strive forward. It's, it's like a hunting turn. You might have watched the David Attenborough uh, documentary and seen him talk about cheetahs 
who are running after their prey, a gazelle or something like that, and they're completely focused. They're striving forward at top speed to get that food, to get that prize, to make it their own. That's what Paul is talking about here. Pressing on, striving forward, having this mindset. He's completely focused. He's straining forward, he says in verse 13. But one thing I do, solely, single-mindedly, focused, forgetting what lies ahead, I strain forward to what lies ahead, forgetting what lies ahead, exerting himself to the uttermost, putting top energy. You might have watched that cheetah run after its prey. It's not, it's not just gaily strolling along. It's speeding. It's just all its energy running extremely fast for that brief moment to try and catch that prey. But what is this prize? What is this goal that Paul is talking about in verse 14? I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's it. It's being with Jesus. It's being with Christ, his, his love, his delight, his greatest treasure. It's being in heaven with him. And because he loves the Lord Jesus Christ, he's striving to put away all sin as he's racing forward through life to when he will receive the upward call. Remember, Paul said to live is Christ, to die is gain. Because he so loves the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ because he wants to get to Jesus Christ. See, for Paul, Christ is all in all. Christ is the beginning of the gospel. Christ is every day. Christ is his hope and his glory, which, like that cheetah, that prey, that antelope might run away and, and, and get away from the cheetah, who then becomes too tired to keep on running. That prey is not guaranteed, even though it might press on and exert itself to the uttermost, Whereas for Paul, for us as Christians, as it says in verse 12, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I press on not to an uncertain, will I make it to the end, but a prize, an inheritance that is there waiting for us. It's guaranteed that well done, good and faithful servant is yours. To press on to achieve it, to attain it. Like an, uh, an Olympic runner who's left the starting block during a 400 meter race, perhaps, striving with all their energy and strength to reach that final finish line where that, that gold medal is guaranteed for them. Paul, in his mindset, doesn't just acknowledge his imperfections, not just then striving to attain that glorious prize, but he's removing all distractions. Anything that, anything that takes his focus away from Christ, it would be a strange sight, wouldn't it? If you are watching the, the 2021 or whenever they're able to have it, the next Olympic Games in Tokyo, and you're watching the, the 400 meter race, and you saw one of the, 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 the runners just stop and, and wave to someone he knows in the audience. Or, or just runs over to ask his mum to, to get some eggs from the shop on her way home. That would be bizarre, wouldn't it? It would never happen. Because that runner, as soon as they hear the, the, the starting piston, they're 100% focused. One thing I do. I press on and pursue removing all distractions, forgetting what lies behind, not looking back. Remember, Paul's talked about his old life. He says, I counted that all as nothing, as rubbish. I'm not looking back, yearning for that position I once had. He's saying, no, I'm striving forward to what I have in Christ, that he is mine and I am his. 
And there's lots that can distract us, can't it, in the Christian life, can distract us from that main goal and, and from our greatest treasure, which is Christ. It's like driving your car down the street in Cheltenham when all the Christmas lights are up. There's so many different things to look at. Probably quite dangerous driving, actually. Imagine it can be quite dangerous. Lots of things to take your focus off what's in front of you. Children in the back saying, oh, look at that snowman. Look at that reindeer. There's lots of things huh, that can distract us from striving forward from pursuing Christ. You can get distracted by career. My greatest treasure is to get that promotion. We can get distracted by family. My greatest desire is to have this many children, to be married to this person. My greatest desire, my greatest treasure is to have this kind of life. It's to drive this car and live in this house and this neighborhood and have children go in this school. And then all your effort is not pursuing Christ, but those other things instead. But what Paul wants to remind the Philippians of is that compared to knowing Christ, compared to the surpassing worth of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, all those things are nothing. Are nothing compared to Christ because all those things won't last. They are temporary. They are trinkets. They are like chocolate gold coins you get at Christmas in your stocking compared to a gold bar you might find in Fort Knox. It doesn't compare. It doesn't mean that those things are bad. It's good to pursue a career. It's good to pursue marriage and family but not if they become ultimate things or a greater treasure than the Lord. He, Paul doesn't want anything to divert his or their attention from Christ. So he says, doesn't he, in verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way, who are growing in grace, who are becoming more like Jesus, think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you. Let's pray. Let's pray that the Lord would reveal any other treasure in our hearts. That we might remove all distractions. Make our horizon, our focus, the Lord Jesus Christ. That we might hold true with both hands to what we have already attained in Christ, because he has attained it for us at the cross and in his resurrection. He rose from the dead as a first fruit, as a guarantee of the rest of the harvest of those who are in Christ. It isn't Paul's future-focused mindset. Isn't that like the future-focused mindset of Christ himself? You read in Hebrews 12, that it was for the joy set before him. The joy set before him that he endured the cross. The joy of his people being forgiven. The joy of being with them forever. Doesn't he say that in John 17 verse 24? Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. To see my glory. See, Christ's greatest desire, what was motivating him to go to the cross, was a love and a delight and a joy for those who would be his. For those who the Father was given to him. For those who he was going to purify, to make his own, to buy back and to save. That he might be with them, they might be with him. No, the Lord Jesus Christ's greatest desire is you. If you are a Christian today, his greatest desire is that he might be with you and you might be with him. And he is looking forward to that day. He can't wait to come back and to gather his beloved to him. <coughs> that there'd be no more social distancing. No more separation. We'll be with Christ forever. For Paul, 
The Lord Jesus Christ is his greatest treasure, his greatest delight. And he loves and longs to be more like Jesus and to be Jesus. You see in Paul that his mindset is future focused. It is a Christ saturated mindset. He wants more of Jesus. He wants to be with Jesus. He acknowledges his, his imperfections, his, his lack of Christ likeness. He's longing for that day where in every part of his life, his mind, his thoughts, his actions, his words, his deeds, he might please his Lord and Saviour. Are you a, a one thing I do Christian? Do you have this single focus, this future focused mindset? Is your greatest treasure is what you're aiming for and focused on Christ. Is he your all in all? We've seen firstly that Paul has a future focused mindset. And we see secondly from verses 17 to 4 verse 1 that this leads then on that it, to a future focused lifestyle. A future focused lifestyle. You remember that Olympic runner that we talked about who was wanting to get that gold medal in the Olympics. But that mindset, that dream, that focus, then impacts the whole of their life, doesn't it? Because what you think about affects how you live. What, what's your treasure and your greatest desire in your mind affects then your actions and how you live. You think about that Olympic athlete for the whole four years leading up to that one race in the Olympics. What are they doing? Well, their everything about their life is geared towards that race because it's their greatest desire. It affects their diet and what they eat. It affects how they use their time. They'll be doing a lot of running and training. They'll be going to the gym. They'll be doing other events to practice. It affects how disciplined they are and what they can and can't do, what they can and can't eat, what they can do and not do with their time. It's because they're so driven in their mind that it affects the whole of their life. Their thinking and their goal and that prize of that gold medal affects all of their doing. And for Paul, it's the same. In verse 17, he he, he wants to talk to them about his lifestyle, about his, his walk or his, his life. He says, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example according you have with us. He's saying, keep your eyes on how we live, how we live a future-focused life, which is driven by a future-focused mindset and desire. He's saying this because there are others around those enemies of the cross. He talks about in verse 18 and 19, the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. God is their belly and the glory and their shame. Their minds are not set on heavenly things. Their minds are set on earthly things. Their greatest desire and their greatest treasure is their belly. So their end is destruction. And they are there. These people who are worldly wise, they are there in the church as well or outside the church. And Paul is warning them, the Philippians saying, don't look at their manner of life. Their manner of life is not according to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their manner of life is driven by an earthly mindset that ends in destruction because it's all about me, myself, and I. No, Paul is saying, keep your eyes on us, those who have that heavenly mindset, who are eagerly awaiting the Lord Jesus Christ to return. Keep your eyes on how we live, because how we think affects how we live. And but Paul's greatest treasure is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his desire and his focus. And so that affects his whole life. <coughs> it affects his whole life. His whole lifestyle 
is Christ-like, and he shows this in contrast to those enemies of the cross. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ was selfless. He denied himself. You read about this in chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. He denied himself. He took on the form of a servant, humbling himself. You read before in the examples of Timothy and Epaphroditus about their selfless, selfless examples, denying themselves to serve Paul, to serve the Philippians. We're here in verse 18. Paul shows his selflessness. He deeply cares about the Philippians. He's writing this letter. He wants to send Timothy and Epaphroditus to them. To be a blessing to them at his own loss. He weeps for them because he loves and he cares for them so much. His mindset is on Christ. He wants to be more like Christ because he loves Christ. And so he's being Christ like. He's being loving and caring and selfless and sacrificial. These false teachers who the enemies of cross, their God is destruction. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. It's all about for them. What can they gain? Feeding their own appetites and lusts, their own cravings. It's what they worship. They worship money. They worship work. They worship food and drink and pleasure, self-indulgence self-gratification it's what they glory in they glory in how much they've drunk they glory in how much money they've accumulated for themselves they glory in their stuff they glory in their sin how many wives they've had life is marked by self-indulgence self-gratification And they want to try and persuade others to join in their self-indulgent lifestyles. There's one thing that struck me about, about lockdown, especially when the students went back like last September. And they weren't either they were back at university, but they were kind of in self-isolation in their halls of residence. They weren't able to go out clubbing or to, or to the bars and enjoy the same kind of social and university fresh as we kind of first year at uni kind of experience as they were hoping and they were looking forward to and they were frustrated and they were angry <coughs> because for them they're missing out on that part of their life well they were never going to get it back again because for them you only get one life and they wanted to live it to the full and anything that would take away from that, they were frustrated. Now for Paul, with a Christ-filled mind, it leaves him to that selfless, sacrificial life. To take up his cross, denying himself, saying no, practicing self-control. Sacrificing his time and money that we can do for others. Because... For those in Christ, this life is not all there is. It's not you get one life, so live it. No, this life is not all there is. And you have Christ, you have an eternity with him. His lifestyle is not just selfless or sacrificial, but it's loving as well. He loves them. In 4 verse 1. Whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. He longs that they will be standing firm together in the Lord, striving together to attain that glorious prize of Christ. That they would love one another. Because that mindset set on Christ, focusing on him, also then has repercussions for how you love one another. For those who also belong to Christ, because we are united together in Christ. And so he wants them 
to be standing firm together, <coughs> to show their unity together. It's this love that motivated the Lord Jesus Christ. It's this love that motivates Paul. And it's this love that should motivate us not to leave anyone behind, to bear one another's burdens, to care for one another, to help those who are struggling. But what characterizes this lifestyle when verse 20 but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that those who have this heavenly and Christ-focused mindset, those who have been born again, those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, are citizens in heaven. Being two places at once. Yes, at the one time we're here on earth. We're living here in, in Cheltenham or Gloucester. But another time, in another place, our citizenship, where we belong, our home is in heaven. And citizenship for the Philippians was a very common idea and something they were very proud of. Because the city of Philippi was a Roman colony. They were inhabitants. They were citizens of Rome. They, they were under Roman law. They wore Roman dress, clothes, they spoke Latin. Their architecture was Romanesque in, in style. They saw the privilege of being citizens of Rome, but they were in Philippi. They were away from Rome, but they lived a Roman life. They lived a Roman life while away from Rome. And there's a wonderful picture of us as Christians. Our home, our citizenship, where we belong is in heaven with Christ. He is our king. That is our home. But we're away from home. As Peter says, we are aliens, strangers and foreigners. In Christ, we belong to him. We've received that heavenly calling. And it's from our home that we eagerly await a saviour to take us home. So that we might be like him, so that our lowly bodies might be transformed to be like his glorious body. So no wonder those who have this Christ-centered, future-focused mindset will have a future-focused lifestyle that is different. That is different because our minds and our because our minds are not set on earthly things, but heavenly things. And so our lifestyle and all that characterizes it should be different. Because we are in the world, but not of the world. We've been transferred from that kingdom of, of, of dark dominion of darkness to the kingdom of light of Jesus Christ. We live a life that should be shaped by the cross and shaped by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in the, in the now, but also the not yet. As one writer said, we are camped between the cross and the tomb. We've experienced the joy of our salvation in Christ and what he's done for us, that we belong to him, that our sins are forgiven, that we are right in the sight of God but we are eagerly awaiting the consummation of that salvation when Christ comes again and we are renewed and we are with him forever. The Paul in his example, showing that true Christianity is future focused, future focused in mindset and therefore future focused in lifestyle. Having a mind and a life that is saturated on Christ, our greatest treasure, to be more like him, to be with him, who Christ is all in all. As one writer said, as Christians, we should live for the things that last. Live for the things that last. Strive to attain the glorious treasure kept and guaranteed in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So, brothers and sisters, 
What do you think about when you think about the future? Fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand firm in the Lord as we eagerly await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you and praise you for Jesus Christ. Let our minds be shaped by Christ. Let our greatest treasure be him because we are his. Let our whole lifestyles be Christ-shaped, cross-shaped. We will put away our sinful ways and strive, strive to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, to show his love to others, standing firm together. Our Father, please write these truths in our hearts. Help us, be with us day by day, that we might stand firm in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to come to our, our closing hymn now this, this, um, this evening. O church, arise and put your armour on. Hear the call of Christ, our captain. close with these words from Jude 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.